The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Listen to a story of greed, innocence, incalculable malevolence, and a mystical, fantastical watch. A watch whose hands held the power of life and death. Our tale is played against the background of the sun-drenched Mediterranean North Shore, around and about the most famous gambling casino of its day. And it takes place some 100 years ago. But the scene is not sun-drenched as our story begins. It's a devil's night out. Look, John, a driveway lined with statues. Come on. There must be a house where we can take shelter. Not there. For God's sake, John. Why not? That's the haunted villa. You? Superstitious? About that place. Anyway, it's boarded up. I've been for years. Well, there's the house now. Maybe we can find some shelter. Right as molten steel. It's gone. Melted. It's never been. Let's get out of here, Charles. I could swear I saw that thing jump and run into the house. Old pillar. Maybe it's on fire. Don't be silly. It's lamplight. Look. The door is open. Welcome, Frank. Ah, this is the night to be abroad. Welcome to the Villa de Espoir. The house of despair. Our mystery drama, The Death Watch, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Jay Gregory. It is sponsored in part by imported Vigna Rosé wine and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Black night, a witch's night, orchestrated with a drum of teeming rain. The wind, a wail of violins, the crash of thunder, a choir of cymbals, and the sudden rebirth of a long dead house, menacingly named the Villa Desespoir, the Castle of Despair. Surely the perfect setting for the strange and terrifying story I shall leave Charles Fleming to tell you in his own words. For a brief second, which seemed endless, John and I sat frozen into immobility, staring at the tall, thin figures. The bristling black eyebrows and the deep widow's peak only emphasized the height of his brow parchment white of his skin. Beside him lurked the misshapen dwarf with an oversized head. Every instinct told me to turn and run, but every external feeling cried out for shelter. Come, gentlemen. Kadrash will see to your horses. Kadrash, I will tend the fire. It is well lit by now. I've got a funny feeling about this, Charles. So have I. But we're armed, and the horses need rest more than we do. You said it was still at least an hour's ride. In this weather. But I don't like his looks. No question. Watch it. The man wants to take the horse. Don't expect any answers from Katrash, gentlemen. He is a deaf mute. But you can trust horses to him. They will never have gentler or more loving care. Well, come in, come in, come in out of this warm, chilling rain. You are most kind to offer us hospitality. <laughs> On a night like tonight, it is no more than human decency. Allow me to present myself. I am Count Vladim Dravanescu. Honored. I am Charles Fleming, and this is my good friend, Dr. John Potter. Now, shall we go in the petit salon, or uh, how do you say in the English, uh, a parlor, eh? <laughs> We have stopped at the fire. <coughs> ah, 
Yes, I must apologize for the smoke. I have just arrived myself, as you can see, and the wood is as wet as all of us. Uh, by which road did you come? From Carlo Casino, where I presume you are headed. Correct. To the home of Colonel Willoughby. Ah, the countryman of yours with the exquisite daughter. Parbleu, one of you must be the lucky man who is affianced to her. Well, not I can't. Charles is the one. Ah, uh, so you are the fortunate man. You've lived in these parts long, Count Ravanesco? Oh, 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 scarcely. As you can tell from my name, I'm Romanian. Oh, I visited here many years ago. Now, as soon as Katrash returns, I can offer you something to eat. Oh, that's kind of you, but I think if the weather will let up, we'll press on to Carlo Casino. <laughs> Naturally, you are anxious to rejoin your bride-to-be. But from the looks of things, it will be some time till that will happen. In the meantime, you uh, will make your home in Carlo Casino, Dr. Popper? No, no. I have a cabana here for the summer months only because I am both an inveterate sun worshipper and gambler. Ah, a kindred spirit. Then while we are waiting, shall the three of us pass the time by seeing which lady luck will smile upon? Why not, Charles? Uh, it's two to one. Ah, then what shall it be? Cobs, dice, dominoes? Name your choice. A shilling limit on that? Fine. No side bet. Ah, the friendliest of games. Now, if you two will pull that gaming table near the fire, I will fetch the die. What hour have you? I make it about half past five. Oh, it's dark and gloomy enough to be midnight. Why do they call this place the Villa of Despair? I'm just one of those local shockers. They say the man who built it 200 or 300 years ago was an alchemist. The bronze statues which you saw lining the drive were all put up there during his occupancy. Those were bloody times, and people dropped out of sight very easily. A legend grew that these statues were his failures. Failures? You mean people believed he was trying to turn the human body into gold? And bronze was the closest he got? <laughs> what rot! What happened to the unsuccessful alchemist? He just disappeared one day as if the earth had opened up and swallowed him. The villa was bought and sold apparently over the years, then later rented. But all the owners, or lessors, reported the groaning of a man in torment all night long, from midnight to sunrise. Uh, nonsense that people believe. But our host is coming back. <laughs> I watched the Count as we played a desultory game of dice with nobody particularly winners or losers. During our game, I had been conscious of a faint, faraway chime of the three-quarter hour. And now, suddenly, I was hearing it again. With a start, he removed from his vest pocket the most beautiful watch I have ever seen. The case made of chased gold set with precious gems. Six o'clock. My little friend reminds me he must be wow. Time is of the essence, eh? Which reminds me it is for us, too. Whether or no, I have a lady I love too well to keep waiting. And the weather has slackened. You'll be with her within the hour. Ah, fortunate man. I envy you. <laughs> My blessed, darling Charles. Oh, thank God you're with me again. Claire, beloved, if it hadn't been for your mother's death, we would already have been together, always. Don't. I... It was clumsy of me. I, I didn't... No, need... no, no, darling. It isn't mother that troubles me. It's Papa. He's become a different man. How? Well, it's, it's all mixed up with mother's death and his own lack of interest in life and the evil... It surrounds all this beauty like a blight. Evil? The gambling fever. It's a sickness. Father is at the casino every night, wagering wildly and stupidly. I'm almost glad that Count Ravanescu bought the old villa de Espoir. Although I must admit, the place and the owner give me the creep. Yes. For all his charm, there's something uncanny about him. 
But why are you glad? Well, the Count and Papa play chess. That's scarcely a gambling game. And probably now that the weather is cleared, Papa will be off right after dinner to the Count's villa. Oh, Charles, I've got so much to tell you. Oh, well, I, I guess for now we'd better go back and join Papa for the meal. Charles, kiss me first. Do I have to be asked? Oh, I hope never. But these days I have such a strange chill foreboding in me. I need to be sure of your love so desperately. Claire's mother had died four months ago, just before our planned wedding. Naturally, it had to be postponed. And it was not surprising that Mr. Willoughby, plagued by the rheumatism and now the loss of his wife, had fled to the Mediterranean to try to recuperate. What was shocking and ominous for Claire's and my happiness was what I watched in the following weeks. Claire's father had become a compulsive, obsessive gambler. Our invitations to Villa des Espoir, in spite of Claire's and my feelings of revulsion for the Count, were always a welcome relief. Till this one particular evening. Claire and I had walked out to the patio, high over the blue Mediterranean, as the Count and her father started to play chess. But by the time we returned... The game had become backgammon. Double. Hmm. That is sixteen. You don't have to accept. Your position is virtually hopeless. Ah, life is never hopeless, old friend, as long as you have it. I accept the double. A five and a two. You have me blocked. Uh, perhaps I was a fool to accept the double. What does it matter? It's only a game, as I said. My life. On the pair of fives I just rolled, I must double again. Thirty-two, and the odds are insuperable. I would have to be superhuman to win. <laughs> Wouldn't I? I doubt if even the Lord's help could bring you through. Will you concede? <laughs> I suppose I haven't mentioned yet that I am a mathematician and a recognized, although amateur, manipulator of cards. I am also an expert on odds under any circumstances. And what I watched happen to my future father-in-law in that simple game of backgammon was beyond all possibility or chance. Double sixes and that clears the board for me. What bad luck. <laughs> Any other throw for you except that one deuce would have given you the game. And the stakes were ridiculously high. Shall we just forget it? No. As an Englishman and a man of honor, I pay my debts. How much do you reckon it is in English pounds? At our original stake, about 150,000. Damn. I didn't follow that. I can't cover that in cash. No need. There's every need. I pay my debts. You will have it once I sell my house. But, Papa, you can't do that. We have to live. I'm ashamed. I had no care if I destroyed myself. But I had no thought of hurting you. No, no. There is really no need for agony. The debt could be satisfied without any harm financially whatsoever. If you are determined to pay. I am determined to pay. I don't see why. It's all so silly. I mean, it, it's just a game. And Claire. I... Yes, Papa? I'm asking you to leave us alone. Yes, Papa? We'll be in the salon. Now, sir. What is your proposition? You have only one possession, I covet, sir. Your daughter. I think I can make her far more happy than an untried boy with no established future. If you would give me her hand or the opportunity to court her openly, why then, it would be I who were completely in your debt. A bargain. Ridiculous today. That could never be struck let alone even suggested. But a uh, hundred years ago, 
not only possible and frequent, but one to which all parties, by the role of society, were honor-bound to accept. I'll return shortly with Act Two. it's incredible to us today that less than a century ago parents owned their children almost as slaves and the children accepted that fact especially if they happened to be girls still with parents who were reasonable human beings even under the fashion of the day most of the young people were not tested in their allegiance except under unusual conditions such as an ashamed and trapped Colonel Willoughby finds himself obvious reasons, I was not present when the colonel told Claire of his bargain with the Count. Had I been, none of the rest of this story might have happened. I won't, Papa. I won't. You can't make me. You don't have to pay this debt. The Count himself told you. It's a matter of honor. Well, I don't think it's that at all. Charles thinks that the Count cheated you. Uh. You can't cheat at that gammon, my dear. Yes, you can. If, uh, well, what did Charles call it? Uh, if you switch the dice. Now, even if he could have changed his, as far ahead as I was, it was impossible for him to win without any bad luck with my dice. But Charles says that he could have palmed your dice. Charles could... says, Charles says. What does he know about it? Well, he just graduated ahead of his college of mathematics. Yeah, to be a teacher. A poor enough living at best. But enough. I must. Pay him the money. Well, sell the house. But don't sell me, Papa. I have to think of your future. The Count is well-born, rich. He is a much-traveled, brilliant man who can introduce you to a life of ease and comfort. I don't want a life of ease and comfort. I want a life of love and happiness. Oh, no, Papa. No, there's no way that you can make me. Hush, no. hush, Claire, beloved. I intend to honor my debt. I can do no less. So that means I can leave you no dowry. I think we owe it to Charles to let him know that. Papa. Charles and I don't need anything from you. We can take care of ourselves. Charles has a teaching job waiting. And we don't need much as long as we have each other. Ah, oh, it's midday. I think I'd take a rest in the study before lunch. Go join your intended, darling. I've interfered enough with your holiday. After Claire had come out and told me of her interview with her father, I had taken some provisions down to the small day sailor and was returning back to the house to pick up Claire and the picnic she had been preparing. When the shot came directly from the house, from the area of the study, I started running immediately, and as I reached the terrace, I heard... quite strong. And he's breathing. Yes. Don't let him move till I get a doctor. No. Thank God John isn't far off. Here, use my handkerchief and my scarf to stem the blood. Yes. Use pressure. I will. Try to keep him from bleeding any more than you yes. can. Just hurry. Hurry. How is he, John? He's alive. He's lost quite a bit of blood, but that's not serious. But he's alive. Uh... Yes. Should he uh, be removed to hospital? No, I don't think that's necessary or even advisable under the circumstances. What do you mean? The bullet entered the throat, passed through the mouth, and came out near the temple. Don't try to hide anything, John. I, we, we've got to know sooner or later. In my opinion, your father will recover, but... There's been brain damage. Oh. 
Not unlike an apoplectic stroke. I'd be less than honest if I didn't tell you there'll be a high degree of paralysis. In the left side, at the least. Your father will be fortunate if he can ever walk again. Is that all? Don't hold back. At the best. He'll need someone to nurse and care for him the balance of his life. I'm sorry, but it's safer to face the truth. I know, John. He's my closest friend. And I thought he was being cautious. But he was telling the exact truth. It was soon enough obvious that Colonel Willoughby would be a helpless invalid for the rest of his life. And to care and house him, there seemed only one normal solution. There just isn't any other way out, Charles. Papa has other debts. The house is heavily mortgaged, and even its sale won't help much. Papa is going to need the kind of care that you and I can't provide for him. I'd argue that. And for sure, there's one thing. You are not going to marry the Count. What else can I do? Although he... He he can't find any way to say it. Papa feels that he's made a marriage contract. I don't understand. I never will. Your father brought all this on himself. Well, he is my father. And I can't abandon him. I'm writing this. My darling because I am not brave enough to tell you in person. I have signed a marriage contract with the Count that will provide for my father's care for the rest of his life. For 20 years, he has taken care of me. I cannot shirk my responsibilities to offer him the same in return. I am sending this to you by John's hand. Please, for both our sakes, Let it be goodbye, for there is nothing left for us but tears. But, oh, I love you so, and always will. I'll be damned if I'll accept it, John. What else can you do? I could shoot the Count. What would that serve? Well, then Claire and I could be married, and we'd take care of her father. We've been over that. It wouldn't work, Charles. Even if you weren't arrested and guillotined. Well, there must be some way out. I could go to the Count and beg him. For what? To give up marrying a woman he desires and also settle 30 or 40 thousand pounds for the care and maintenance of her half-alive father? Well, at this point, anything's worth a chance. I'm afraid this is an impossible gamble. Far better that... Gamble? Gamble, of course. That's the answer. Have you a pack of cards? Yes. Stay in the drawer beside you. I'll take a new deck. Open it. Shuffle the cards. Remember I said I would play anything but cards when the Count suggested that friendly dice game? Yes. Well, let me show you why. I could take all night to shuffle these cards, but uh, this will suffice to illustrate. Cut them. Cut them as many times as you want. Well, what's the point? Do as I say. Very well. And this has always been a hobby with me. Up till now. You know the game of poker? (laughs) I should. I've lost enough at it. You needn't have. If I'd been dealing. What do you want? Two pair? Full house? Flush? Just call it. You can deal me anything you want? Provided I can stack the deck. But that's cheating. What did you think the Count was doing in the backgammon game he won that ruined the Colonel? Can you prove it? Only by playing his game. I couldn't guess his mechanical means, and he won't be able to guess mine. Bad luck that your horse should throw a shoe, but Kadrash will treat his hoof and have him reshot as good as new. <laughs> In the meantime, what can I offer you, gentlemen? Sherry? Brandy? I'm not much for drinking by daylight. How about a game of chance to while the time away? Uh, perhaps, if these stakes are uh, interesting enough. I think I can make them as interesting as you want. It's for example, if I win, you tear up Colonel Willoughby's IOU and... The contract of marriage to Claire. 
And if you lose, I give you my life. Charles, wait. Wait. What on earth would I do with your life, Mr. Fleming? As long as I live, you have no hope of winning Claire's love. With me out of the way is your only chance. Ah, now you tempt me. What is the game? I suggest bluff, or poker, if you prefer to call it that. We just heard it, John. Uh, no, John can be the arbiter, or my second, if you wish. You have Kadosh for your... <laughs> it begins to sound more and more like a duel. If you would prefer that. Oh, no, 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 by all means. I wish you no harm. And perhaps you should have your chance. But suppose I refuse. Then I will kill you first, before myself. Dear me, such a fire breather, pistol in hand. <laughs> I tell you what, I accept all your conditions, but add one of my own. To the winner goes this watch. The same time we met before, it sounded its delicate chimes. Win all, lose all. Your beloved, your father-in-law's medical care, this watch, as against your life. Oh, the more fool I, but I never can resist the wager. Poker is a game of nerves and minor bluffs, of risks against odds, of learning to sit back and wait, of finding the big hand and losing or winning. But there is no cheating. I played from the beginning for the big kill. My life against all the cash the Count had, plus his papers, plus his exquisite watch with its lovely musical chime. Then, at last, the big hand. The Count sitting pat with the unbeatable flush in spades. I had dealt him. Cards? I play these. A dealer takes two. You bet. Ten thousand pounds. Meet you and raise the same. Back and forth we raised. It no longer matters the sum we arrived at. The Count broke first and called me. Diamond Flush, Royal. Why the devil? You had the nerve to draw two cards to that against my straight flush, nine to king? I was gambling for my life. So you win, then. You have your girl, your freedom to marry, and the watch. I don't want to accept it. I know, you must. <laughs> that is the game as it is played. Ah, but uh, I must wind it. Ah. <laughs> How stupid of me. It is no longer my duty. You wind it, sir. Is that necessary at the moment? Since you own it, decide for yourself. Open the bag. I opened it. Like all those old hunter watches, after you bent back the rear flange, the works were still covered by a second gold door. On this one were engraved the words, Wind me at six, or before the sun sets, or by twelve that same day, your own sun sets. <laughs> Which of us is loser or winner, Mr. Fleming, eh? You have your girl. But have a care for your life. <laughs> Curiouser and curiouser, said Alice in Wonderland. Stranger and stranger, we can say, as this story turns and twists. Who is Count Dravenescu, really? Does the watch have some magic power? Or is superstition enough to create that power in the lovely jeweled watch with its golden hands? I'll return shortly with Act Three. That runs, every clock that ticks tells away the hours of a man's life, but none so specifically as this curious chronometer claims to, if it is really dangerous. Certainly, as Charles reports back joyfully to Claire, nothing is further from his mind than the watch or that it might have any significance in his future. <laughs> I feel as if... 
I feel as if someone reprieved me from the Bastille. <laughs> Just before my personal tumble was about to roll. You're sure you don't harbor any secret desire for Count Dravinescu? Oh, what would make you say that? Uh, slightly guilty conscience. You? I had to run my own bluff to get him into the card game. But you offered your life for me. My life would have meant nothing to him. Except... Except? Well, I had to say that as long as I was alive, he... He could never hope for your love or regard. Which was only the truth. I hope. Oh, I want you to believe. I believe. But... But? Well, there's something about this man. You have to sense that somehow he has enormous powers, enormous resources. But he can't touch us now, Charles. I cheated the Count, you know. He cheated my father, you said. Yes. But two wrongs don't make a right. I'm sentimentalist enough to wish I could have won you in fair battle. Oh, you didn't have to win me, Charles. I was, am, and always will be yours. Nothing can interfere with that. Charles, just to make sure, will you do something for me? Anything. <laughs> well, you've already proved that. But just once more... Will you drive me out to the villa? I want to talk to the Count myself. There's no need for that. Ah, you're not afraid I'll change my mind. Of course not, but I only sense that any contact with Count Vladimir Dravinescu is fraught with a kind of inexpressible danger. Feeling like a superstitious fool, I agreed to drive her out the following afternoon. I dressed carefully and scrupulously for the encounter. Forgetting no bauble that would suggest that I was more well-to-do than was actually the case. And not forgetting a pistol. Because I had no trust in the Count. The one thing I forgot, or who knows, I was spelled into forgetting, was the watch. So, this is the famous, uh, or should I say infamous, Villa des Espoirs. Look at the bronze statues. I am looking. Oh, they're so lifelike. Hope that old legend John tells isn't true. Look, Charles, one of the statues is missing. That's the one that was struck by lightning the first night John and I were here. Uh, well, let's forget that for a moment. Charles? Yes, dear? Will you let me see the Count alone? I think I can make an easier peace between us. Whatever was said between them left Claire happy and released by the time she returned to me. I suppose he duped her as thoroughly as he duped me, by consuming time. It wasn't until we were leaving that I realized that it was almost six. It was a late sunset that evening. On the way back, Claire couldn't understand my reckless haste. Charles, we have to drive so far. What time is it? Just before six. Damn. What's the matter? Oh, just something foolish. You know this road. Can we make it back home before six? No, not a chance. Well, how does it matter? Father has his nerves. Why do we have to hurry so dangerously? On the way home, I should have told Claire about the watch and its special chimes, which musically told the hour and the legend about its winding and the six hours of life that were left to the one who owned it and forgot to wind it before six o'clock. But it seemed such a ridiculous fancy that I decided to forget about it. Except... Suddenly, I was assailed by an unreasonable pain in my stomach. What is it, darling? I, I don't know, dear. Just uh, a sort of a cramp. But you're in pain. Uh, not anymore. I, I must have thrown a muscle out of alignment for a moment. I'm fine now. How soon uh, will we be back at the house? Oh, not about 15 minutes or less. Good. I couldn't wait to get home to rewind the watch in the hope of gaining some relief. For instead of just my former slight twinge of superstition about the watch's deadly warning, the pain and the sort of creeping paralysis that seemed to be affecting me had changed my mind. I no longer considered that malicious message a joke in bad taste, but perhaps the literal truth. That damnable watch. When I snatched it out of my bureau drawer, it was running. The hands at half past six. And the chimes, which had sounded so sweet and gentle before now, 
rang in my ears stridently as if tolling my approaching death. I tried to wind it, but the stem was frozen, as frozen as I was becoming myself. The agonizing pain was spreading out like some evil flower, and already I felt like a corpse with rigor mortis setting in. Pocketing the watch, I went first to see John. There's no particular symptom I can put my finger on, except I don't like your reflexes. What's the matter with them? Oh, they're sluggish. Your pulse and heartbeats are a little slower than normal. I'd like to put you in the hospital for observation. No. Certainly by tomorrow, if you don't improve. If I don't improve by tomorrow, I'll be dead. There's only one person who can help me now. You cheated me into winning that watch from you. My dear Mr. Fleming, you were the cheat. You co-decked me. You knew? Young man, you were talking to a professional. You were an amateur. Oh, an accomplished one. But still, I've never cheated in a game of cards in my life before. But I felt I could against you, since I know you cheated Claire's father in that backgammon game. Certainly I did. All is fair in love and war, correct? But why did you let me win? You told me that yourself. To get rid of that watch. Well, you must... Help me. You'd call off the charm or whatever it is. That is beyond my power. And I'm doomed. There's nothing I can do. But at least, whether I'm a dead or alive, you will never have Claire. Thank God I saved her from you. So you did. Alas, poor child, she will mourn you, Mr. Fleming. I have no wish to hurt her, so perhaps I can offer you some help. What? How? I have the power to give you an extension of 24 hours. What good is that? Time enough to go to Monsieur Jacinet, the jeweler, first thing tomorrow morning. Have him act as your agent to sell this quickly. Make the price low enough so that someone will be sure to take it as a bargain. I hope I'll last till tomorrow. <laughs> It's almost seven o'clock. I came to tell you dinner was almost ready. Is you still up to it? Oh, of course I do. But first, Charles, now that Father is, we're not going to wait to get married, are we? I'm ready tonight. Tomorrow at the latest. Oh, well, I may need a little more time than that. But, but I'm glad. Because now I can give you your wedding present. <laughs> Please. I just found it today at Mr. Chardonnay's. And it's such a bargain. Oh, I hope you don't have one like it. What is it? It's a watch. Look, how lovely. And listen, listen to that lovely chime. <laughs> Just like Big Ben. And then, after, it'll strike the hour and it... What is it? What? Ah, what? Oh, just a pain. Oh, it'll go. Claire, did, did you wind the watch at six o'clock? No, Monsieur Jordan has said it was wound tightly, and it would run until tomorrow. It... Oh, oh, Charles, what, are... what are you doing? Put me down. Where are we going? Village of Espoir, and the Count. Uh, Pray God he has a little kindness left in him. <laughs> you two little fools to deny me what I want. Whatever I cannot have, I destroy. You refuse to help Claire. Extend her the same time at least you extended me. I not only refuse, I am going to revel in watching your beloved who dared to turn me down, freeze in immobility, like all the other statues that line the driveway. At least I can deny you that. <laughs> no bullet can touch me, Mr. Fleming. No human agency. Then kill me with her. I will not live without Claire. I will be glad to oblige you. After you have watched your beloved die in agony, you devil! The Antichrist. That's who he is. On our side, you said no human agency could touch you. 
But they say God listens to a virgin's prayer. I call on him to strike you dead. A bolt burst through the window, its jagged blade entering the Count's head, down through his feet and into the floor. He was one molten blaze of heat from which we had to turn away. And by the time we turned back, he was gone. And with him, the watch. And all Claire's pain. Already a raging fire had started, and together we fled to Villa de Espoir. Nor would we have stopped our headlong rush, except for one astounding sight, which has remained in the back of our minds, serving to make sharper and greater our thanks to God for the long and happy marriage we still enjoy. Look, Claire. Claire. The empty statue base. Empty no longer. John used to sneak in here as a child. No wonder the Count looked familiar to him. <gasps> Frozen forever again in bronze was Count Dravanescu. His body twisted as if in some inner agony. His face seamed with pain. And the deadly watch in his hand. Villa de Sespoir burned to the ground that same night, and the property was disposed of for taxes. All of the statues were sold, except the one of the Count, which could not find a buyer. And so he stands alone in his eternal torture, watch in hand, waiting for a reprieve which will never come again. I'll be back shortly. pity of today's tale, I suppose, is that the Count Vladim Dravanescu, as he called himself, could only have been a minor demon. What a pity it wasn't the head man himself. But, as all of us can plainly see every day, the devil's work is never done. I'm sure we'll be meeting him in one form or another in other tales, but then perhaps we shouldn't object too much. He does put a lot of excitement into our tales. Our cast included Jay Gregory, Marion Seldes, Robert Dryden, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. You feel no pain. No pain. Very well. I am going to perform a minor surgical operation now. You will feel no pain, of course. A simple incision at the base of the skull. There will be no bleeding. Nah. Now, what I am inserting, Sarah, is a very small device which your body will in no way reject. It is in every way compatible. By means of this device, it is better you know this, Sarah, although you will not be aware of it later. Through this device, we shall be able to read your thoughts and participate in them, guide them. This will be possible at great distances, light years, actually. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. <laughs>